Well, again, a warm welcome to all joining us today uh, for this first event uh, sponsored by the American Society of International Law, International Economic Law Interest Group of 2022. Uh, we are delighted to have so many of you with us from around the world. My name is Kathleen Clausen. I am one of the co-chairs of the ASIL International Economic Law Interest Group, and we are delighted uh, to collaborate with a number of organizations uh, on this first event of the year. A 360 degree perspective on climate change in the Caribbean. We have a terrific lineup uh, today. And so I'm going to quickly pass the floor over to our moderator. Uh, but first, I just want to thank our tech team from the University of Miami Law School, uh, Ryan Erickson and George Casali. We thank you so much for your assistance. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over again to our distinguished moderator and one of our uh, uh, prized members of the interest group, uh, Dr. Jan Eve Remy, director of the Sridath Ramphal Center at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Remy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Good day, wherever you are. Um, my name is Jan Eve Remy, um, and I'm so pleased to be on this panel. Um, which is one of many workflows emanating from the Sridhar Ramphal Center, as well as the, Uni the United States Embassy in Bridgetown, Barbados, uh, that we started collaborating on last year. Let me also thank the ASIL International Economic Law Interest Group of 2020, and in particular Kathleen and Julian for hosting us and persevering in their effort to ensure that the Caribbean's perspective on international law is made more visible by the work being done by ASIL. We thank you and hope that this is just one of a long list of lasting and fruitful collaborations in this vein. Today I'm pleased and I dare say humbled to be here with my sisters from the Caribbean region, each of whom uh, has distinguished herself on the international law scene. We share a connection, not only in each having attended similar institutions, the Cave Hill campus at the University of the West Indies and or Cambridge University, but also now have through our individual work all converged on one of the existential crises facing the Caribbean region and the world this code red issue of climate change, which each of us is tackling from an international rights-based perspective, armed with tools of advocacy and the rule of law as a means of reforming and shaping the global landscape so that it is rendered more effective, equal, fair, and representative in how it accommodates the concerns of small island developing states. States. Of course, it would not have escaped you that we are also women of color, which adds a whole other hue, no pun intended, to this conversation. I'm serving today as in a dual capacity, both as moderator and presenter, uh, so I'm bound to be less effective in one role. My brief to each of the presenters was simple to present a legal perspective on how each of the legal regimes in which she operates is engaging with the climate change crisis and articulate what she thinks is the path for transforming that space to better accommodate the unique perspectives of small island developing states or SIDS and CARICOM in particular. For those of you who may not know, CARICOM is the collectivity of 15 independent, one, uh, 14 independent and one overseas territory of the Caribbean region, which have decided to band together and coordinate policy on areas of economic and functional cooperation, including the environment, but which retains separate competence in undertaking international legal obligations, including as it relates to climate change and related fields. I'll start with asking for presentation in the investment field, followed by the human civil ECOSOC rights, 
then squarely climate change discussions, and finally trade. Each of us has 10 to 15 minutes to present our views, after which we hope we can engage in a fruitful collaborative discussion with each other and you, the audience. And I'll ask you to write in any questions or comments that you may have throughout the presentations so that we can get to them in the final 15 to 20 minutes that we have reserved for that kind of more off the cuff discursive element. Let me start with Ms. Akima Paul Lambert because she has to leave us unfortunately prematurely. Uh, Akima was by way of background, Akima will present on the investment angle. She was the youngest vice president of Friends of the Earth, Grenada, and was a United Nations Global 500 Environmental Laureate. She has since trained as a litigator and is a partner at Hogan Lovells, where she is spearheading the creation of a Caribbean desk. She's passionate about climate change mitigation. Her perspective is investment, having litigated one of the first investment disputes raising environmental issues on behalf of the government of Grenada. We'll then turn to Ms. Melania Lane, who is an international human rights lawyer and researcher from Jamaica. She has experience working with human rights bodies and organizations such as the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the United Nations and the International Human Rights Clinic, Harvard Law School. I first encountered Melanie in her role as a coordinator and ultimately presenter of an effort before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights hearing on the impact of extractive industries on human rights and climate change in the Caribbean. Ms. Ruano Haynes is an international climate law and governance specialist and TEDx 2020 speaker with over a decade of experience in the UN climate process. A former Trinidad and Tobago diplomat, Rano has negotiated for the Caribbean community as well as the alliance of small island states, including in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. Presently, she is a senior legal advisor at Climate and Analytics and director of Climate Analytics Caribbean office in Trinidad and Tobago. I encountered Rana because of the work she has done representing CARICOM and CIS most recently in the Glasgow negotiations of the UNFCCC. And finally, humbly myself, I'm director of the Sridhar Ramphal Center. I direct uh, the outreach, research, uh, and training efforts of the SRC, where I teach trade law, Caribbean regional integration, under the SRC's flagship Masters in International Trade Policy, uh, I've also um, been involved uh, prior at the WTO, Appellate Body Secretariat, and worked as a senior associate at a law firm in Geneva, as well as uh, Washington, D.C. So that is a 360 introduction. I'm going to ask Ms. Akima Lambert uh, to start us off on the investment field uh, and give her her 10 to 15 minutes. Welcome, everyone, and over to you, Akima. Thank you very much. Thank you, Genevieve, and thank you very much to all my panelists, and thank you for attending. Um, as Jen said, I was going to speak about investment, but with an angle on investment disputes, um, because if I were to speak on investments in its full panoply, we'd be here all afternoon, and that is my specialism, um, investment disputes, disputes more globally. And I just wanted to start off by one thing that my personal Shiro, um, Mia Marti, said at COP26. And she said, my friends, our world stands at a fork in the road, one no less significant than when the United Nations was formed in 1945. And she says, we must work with who is ready to go because the train is ready to leave. I found that particularly poignant. And in the context of investment disputes in the Caribbean context, my question, what I'm going to laser in on today, are investment disputes jumpstarting or putting a break on that train? And there's been a lot of trepidation around, um, as Jean said, the first case that came out, out of the Caribbean, just discussing um, climate 
on a macro level. And I will seek today to put that in context with just a few observations and questions. So the first thing I would say is that in the context of investment disputes, we have been seeing globally, um, this is not a particularly Caribbean phenomenon, foreign investors using investment arbitration as a shield and as a sword. We've seen in commercial arbitration, um, whenever we arbitrate, you know, the force majeure clauses come up. We've seen change of position, we've seen frustration. Um, and investor state arbitrations, we've seen reliance on, you know, the bilateral investment treaties. Um, they bring claims, they say that public regulatory action is stymieing um, their developments. Um, claiming expropriation, violation of the most favored nation provisions, and then the states um, in return, say policy objectives, security, morality, health, the environment. So the first thing I wanted to say is that this is a story that has been played out on the world stage um, at various times, and the Caribbean is more different. We are now coming into our own in relation to this space. I'm going to start by commenting on the Grenada case, but I can only comment on matters in the public domain because of my involvement. And I'll just give you a very short summary, given the time that we have. It was the Grenada Private Power Limited and WRB. And I should say even that case shows how far we've come because there was a oil case a few years ago um, that was the oil interest on Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And the award starts with Offshore oil is the economic heritage of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and now we do not start from the premise that oil is the economic heritage of any particular island. So I guess that's progress. So what happened in um, WRB and Grenada, the beautiful and bountiful island of Grenada, blessed with abundant sunshine, you can tell where I'm from, um, three volcanoes, lots of wind, um, great potential for geothermal and solar energy, um, was still reliant on fossil fuels and the generation of power by fossil fuels. It stemmed from the privatization of the public utility company in 1994. Um, that privatization, the World Bank um, had given advice um, that the utility should have been privatized in 1994. And um, it was privatized and sold um, to a, a family in, in, in the USA. Now, between 2011 and 2015, Grenada's energy costs were in the region of um, four to 10 times more expensive than what you would find in the USA for a small island state, for a developing country, for the economy, for investment. It's quite frankly, it was quite crippling. And even the Inter-American Development Bank um, noted and, and, and gave several warnings that the development of the energy resources was hampering development. So what happened? Q 2016, there were some energy reforms to pursue renewables. Reforms were implemented. Um, WRB, the entity um, who had purchased, said, said this was a repurchase event. Um, Grenada lost its claim at ICSID. Um, and the fact that WRB failed to invest in renewables was considered in the arbitration. So it was a case that touched and concerned renewable energy, but it wasn't necessarily about renewable energy. I think that's the first question or that's the first point that we should make. And the tribunal ruled that WRB was under no legal obligation to share the government's view of what was in Grenada's best interest. And many have been more in this paragraph in the judgment, you know, arguing it's possibly a presidential value, it augurs badly for raising environmental defenses in the region, it could put a stop on renewables um, and, and, and investment from of other states into renewable energy. I say no. I think we must look at a decision in a specific context. It must be confined to specific facts. It was in relation to an arrangement made in the 1980s and it should be viewed through 1980s prism in a specific country context. But what does it tell us? I have five observations that I'll make if Johnny will allow me to make them. The first is an existential one. I think we must come back um, to this distinguished group of international economic lawyers. Is investment arbitration the correct forum to decide these types of investment disputes? Can or do arbitrators have legitimacy to decide the validity really of state conduct in areas touching and concerning the, the, the public interest, particularly when it concerns small island states who have very limited resources or having to make decisions that affect lives in real time, as Mia Motley says, code red. 
Um, and let's face it, um, the, at the intersection or at the confluence of international economic law and these multilateral efforts, they were never designed to account for each other's objectives. So in a sense, we're putting a square peg into a round hole by expecting international economic law, by expecting international investment arbitration to fix or to plot the gap. Um, and, 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 and this brings to the fore the problem because many commentators have said after reviewing this decision that isn't it the government's right as enshrined in international law to determine the public interest, to regulate accordingly, and how important must this be for developing states? So that's the first point I'm making. The second observation I will make is, has to do with the absence of a regulatory and legislative framework for climate on an island by island basis, and that's telling. Um, what the tribunal said is telling, and, and it said three things. It says there were no statutory or contractual obligations to develop renewable energy. The root of the problem was the initial decision to create the regulatory framework and then to set no performance targets for renewable energy. So where are we now? Is the problem investment? Is the problem investment arbitration? Is the problem the relative lack of a regulatory and legislative vacuum, is it that? Is it a failure to enshrine our environmental protections in our development contracts? And the points I will make, I have no answers. I have only questions, I'm afraid. Is it time to enshrine protection of the environment into a constitutional objective, into a supranational objective for the OECS and for CARICOM? Um, do we need a CARICOM version of the UK Climate Act? Don't we need to start setting renewable energy targets as part of a local legislative framework? The third point I'm gonna make has to do with how we future-proof our investment contracts. This was made in you know, 19, 1984. What can we do now? Um, there've been lots of scholarship on what developing states can do now. Um, and one of the things that I've found particularly interesting is how we can make dispute settlement conditional on meeting certain minimum standards on sustainable development. Um, I think we need to exploit greater access to counterclaims um, and filtering the arbitrability provision um, on the basis of whether certain sustainability targets have been met. Now, the, 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 the practical um, side of this is that do we have the power, do we have the negotiating expertise, and do we have the capacity to really negotiate on these terms um, in the Caribbean. And this is really what's hampering um, development of such um, remedies or um, taking such an approach at an early stage. And the fourth point I wanted to make was that all is not lost. Um, even if you say, well, investment arbitration is not the right forum to be litigating or to be resolving these kinds of disputes, there's work to do in the national courts. It's not the only form of um, dispute resolution that can have a debilitating or even a strengthening effect on climate change. Um, we just looked at Antigua and Barbuda, which has filed a claim um, under the law of the sea with the United Nations. So there's the international um, remedy as well. But we must not negate or forget about the national courts. And they've long been used as a shield and a sword. And I'm not saying this because I started my career and I'm still a litigator at heart. Um, I believe that the courts may still be the forum of choice, um, public nature, it's binding, it's set in precedent, no confidentiality. This is what um, you know, states need. Um, this is what those who are driving the climate agenda need. We need you know, greater um, transparency in terms of decision making that can be implied uh, across the board, not necessarily just to one or two individuals. And when we look at things like the Uganda case in the Netherlands, where you know, they received a court order mandating the government to pursue more stringent policies, you can actually see what can be done. But even closer to home, there was a case filed in Latin America. Um, I think it was the Providencia case that was the first displacement case um, for Colombia about not um, doing enough to advance the climate agenda. And very recently, we just had a case uh, claim brought in Guyana, um, where there was an allegation that Guyana violated um, constitutional rights. Now, whether or not you can 
you, you what you think about the merits of these, it goes to show that there are multiple avenues that are still open. So do we strengthen our national courts in the Caribbean? Um, do we build capacity in our national courts to respond um, to these points? The I have to leave um, sort of ready, but there's the final thing I wanted to say, which is point five, is um, there's been a sea change in the UK as well in terms of how supply chain contracts um, have been litigated. We've seen the of Barbie and Shell um, case in English courts, and increasingly we're seeing litigants outside of the jurisdiction to pursue claims in the English courts. But I think what a shame it is um, that litigants outside of the 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 um, the, the, the English jurisdiction having to find remedies um, within it. So I think that's a lesson to us that if we want remedies, if we want to make sure in the words of Mia Motley that we don't mind the closing doors, we need to start thinking about how we make our own systems and how we make uh, a regional effort to really integrate um, and to strengthen and build capacity in our local courts. Um, to make sure that we can deliver on climate objectives. Wow, Akima, that's a, a, a pretty impressive and ambitious way to start us off. Um, and I know that uh, time commitment uh, that you had uh, will force you to leave in five minutes. Um, I wonder if any of my co-panelists wanted to raise anything um, with Akima or any of the persons in the audience who wanted to take advantage of the last seven five to seven minutes we have with Akima based on anything she said in her presentation. Anyone, any, anyone um, wanted to say anything? Well, I will. <laughs> um, Akima, I thank, thank you for, you know, raising this issue, especially in the litigation context of how uh, the Caribbean is, um, has dealt with the first sort of climate-related renewable energy case, and even the characterization of that as a climate change renewable energy case may be a little bit of a stretch. But having litigated that case and also you know, viewing it more from a dispassionate global perspective, I wonder if there are any lessons that you can draw for us in terms of using um, the lessons you learned from there as a basis for any reform? I mean, you mentioned some of them. I think you gave a perspective that, you know, that raises some questions, but uh, litigation is often used in the region, um, you know, sparingly, at least from my perspective in trade. Um, but is the, are there other ways, either in dispute settlement or elsewhere, that you think the Caribbean should be playing a more um, robust role in shaping the rules. So I'm talking about reform discussions in UNCTA trial and where the Caribbean is not currently heavily represented. Are there things that we need to do more offensively and proactively in the event? Well, you're actually asking the wrong person because I can be completely revolutionary on this, you know, and, you know, I think um, if you really, you know, we can sit, we can refine, we can reform the rules. And I think it's absolutely imperative that we do all of that, that we, you know, we join forces together as a unit with CARICOM, with the OECS, we get involved in making sure that, you know, build capacity, regional capacity, so that we don't um, sign up to contracts that we would later regret. Um, so all of that is, is necessary, but I think, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Caribbean had its own dispute resolution center wouldn't it be wonderful if, you know, and I can, I can be, we can be completely revolutionary. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a methodology whereby we could use any of the Caribbean arbitration centers um, as a mechanism for conciliation? Because as you say, dispute is, is, is a long-term um, messy thing. And I always say my aim is to keep my clients um, out of the courts. My aim is to do myself out of a job. Um, so um, would it be, wouldn't it be wonderful to have um, a center where we can build capacity at the same time on a preventative basis, but separately, if a dispute arises, why don't we have a center of conciliation where we staff it with a panel of experts who can help to bridge the gap, show how um, sustainability objectives can be tied into the model so that it's creative, it's collaborative, um, and we get a win-win solution for everyone. 
Uh, we, we don't want you out of a job yet, Akima. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so much for you to do in this region and, and really happy that you're doing such important work in with your, your law firm in bringing this Caribbean litigation practice to the fore. There's one little question that Max Hilaire has asked, which is, has the precedent you obtained um, for Grenada been invoked to your knowledge by other Caribbean islands? Um, I couldn't hear Janine very well. Oh, I'm sorry. So Max Hilaire has asked a question. Has the precedent, your opinion, you can look at it in the Q&A window. Has the precedent uh, in the Grenada case been invoked by other Caribbean islands? I don't know if you are aware. Well, this is, a, this is an arbitration. So there is really no precedent in the sense that we understand it, say, in litigation. But in terms of, you know, the colloquial meaning of precedent, I guess, you know, people will or states are free um, to raise the same arguments um, and to say um, we should be taking into account the nation's interest whenever you encounter um, either an investment contract or a multilateral treaty um, where there's an obligation to develop. And if there is no specific reference to renewables, there should be, particularly in the energy context. Um, so. I think in the in the looser sense, um, it does create a precedent, and I, I would love to see this arise again, personally, um, to be ventilated in a different fora to see what results might be obtained. Thank you so much, Akima, and sorry to have to have front-loaded all the questions to you, but I know you unfortunately have to leave us, so thank no you, uh, and we look forward to doing this again with you, so thank you so much for the opening opening um, innings with, with on this on this Caribbean uh, panel on climate change. Uh, I want to move to a slightly different but connected area of international law where we've been seeing increasingly um, a Caribbean voice being ventilated. And I want to singularly uh, recognize uh, Ms. Malini Aline, who, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, brought some of the concerns from a human rights uh, economic, social, uh, civil uh, perspective um, to the forefront in the context of a hearing um, taking place before the Inter-America um, Human Rights Commission. Uh, Malene, I wonder if you'd be able to take us through what, well, I know you, you have your presentation already, but what was that about and what lessons can you draw from where the Caribbean region, uh, what it has to say on this topic as it relates to uh, climate change and, and human rights and civic and other obligations. Over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jan. And um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, to respond to your question first before getting into my presentation, uh, the process of requesting this hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, I think, well, it had a number of goals. So first, we wanted to highlight that the Caribbean perspective in this discussion of, of climate change is extremely important. We're disproportionately impacted by climate change, but I think the voices, especially of, of marginalized communities such as rural and indigenous communities are often you know, marginalized in terms of agenda setting and decision-making at the international level. So I think it was important to have a movement, a regional movement of communities and advocates where we went to the commission and we gave on the ground testimony of what, you know, the, the links between extractivism and climate change. Uh, but beyond the actual hearing itself, I think it was a, a really important opportunity to create linkages across movements and across communities because climate change is a cross cutting issue. It's not just about, you know, impacts on one place or one community. It is about what it's doing to a region. It's about you know, our history of exploitation. It is about our current status of being marginalized in the international political economy. And so um, I thought a movement building framework was important in terms of bringing so many organizations together. And um, importantly, we, we came with an important message, which is that the current legal framework, international human rights law framework for combating climate crisis needs to be strengthened and leveraged. And I will get into that in my presentation. I think that's a nice segue in terms of, of what I'm gonna to discuss today. So um, my organization uses human rights law to tackle legacies of slavery and colonialism because we can't talk about climate crisis without talking about those leg legacies. So my work looks at the climate crisis from a decolonial rights-based perspective and this simply means that I focus on the links between colonialism, 
the current racial capitalist order and climate crisis. And I then look at the human rights implications for formerly colonized nations and peoples with a focus on indigenous, Afro-descendant and rural communities. And then finally, I examine how human rights tools can be strengthened and leveraged to combat climate crisis as a legacy of colonialism. And this is kind of how I've structured my presentation for today to, to literally mimic how I do my work as a, as a human rights lawyer. So for me, there is nothing particularly surprising about the climate crisis. In fact, I think, I mean, the name is, is, is a little peculiar to me. Uh, climate crisis is the logical consequence of a racial capitalist order that normalizes resource plundering, indigenous dispossession, and the relegation of former colonies to sacrificial zones of extraction. And frankly, that's what we are in the Caribbean, right? Um, basically sacrifice zones because foreign investors come to our shores and they destroy and dispossess and mine for oil, precious metals, bauxite, and all of this so that foreign shareholders can maximize profit and a few people in rich countries can overconsume. So this is the true crisis. And so before we can talk about legal solutions and perspectives, I think we have to confront the fact that the dominant economic system based on ecocide exploitation and overconsumption makes climate crisis inevitable. So there are four principled statements I want to make about root causes before talking about legal pathways to a future beyond climate crisis. And I think, I think we implicitly know some of these. The problem is translating this understanding into actual action. So first, the racial capitalist order and the extractivist model that sustains it are the root causes of the climate crisis. Second, this is a racial justice issue since climate crisis disproportionately impacts former colonies and racialized communities, such as those in the Caribbean. In other words, the nations and peoples who, are now, who now bear the brunt of the climate crisis are precisely those nations and peoples who were once colonized on the basis of false notions of their racial inferiority. So today, our very survival is at stake with rising sea levels and catastrophic weather events. But beyond that, Extractivism is simultaneously fueling climate change while dest destroying climate resilient livelihoods and resources. This crisis is therefore complex and multidimensional. Third, this situation of crisis is sustained by colonial and neocolonial governance forms that exclude vulnerable communities from public participation, access to information and access to remedy. In the Caribbean, where laws and policies create an imbalance of power in favor of the entities that ensure climate crisis and against the communities who could build pathways to a future beyond climate crisis. This is reproduced at the international level where racialized communities are excluded from decision-making and ad agenda setting. And I'll touch on this a little later in my presentation. But I want to use Jamaica, where I'm from, as a case study on how post-colonial governments have sustained the colonial laws and practices that ensure climate crisis. You know, the government has an international obligation, of course, to promote respect for human rights. And um, I think this obligation must be understood within a larger context in which the current order and structure makes it impossible for communities in formerly colonized countries to enjoy human rights. So in Jamaica, for example, the government has given the green light for bauxite mining in the cockpit country. And I think the cop cockpit country, what's happening there is an emblematic case of what climate crisis means for the Caribbean and for, for lawyers and legal professionals, professionals working on this issue. Um, cockpit country is Jamaica's last remaining wet rainforest and is integral to combating the effects of climate change. Um, this is recognized in Jamaica across the world. This is a, you know, cockpit country is well known for its biodiversity and ecological sensitivity. Cockpit country, however, is also responsible for the supply of about 40% of fresh water in Jamaica. And of course, you know, water is a resource that is threatened by climate change impacts. But beyond all of that, cockpit country for me is part of a decolonial imaginary that challenges the colonial extractivist model that is fueling the climate crisis. So I'm not sure if, if you've read about cockpit country or visited it for, for those of us, those in the, in the audience who visited Jamaica, but cockpit country is the home of the Maroons who fled enslavement and established land use patterns for agricultural production that stand apart from the extractivist model. And cockpit country is also home to deep rural communities whose traditional knowledge and ways of relating to the land are central to combating climate crisis. 
And, you know, with my work in the bauxite alumina industry, I was just in one of those communities last week. And, you know, what I saw in terms of how they have chosen to live and what bauxite mining is doing in terms of displacing that livelihood is extremely tragic and is um, a, a story for another webinar, but I just wanted to, to put that there. But so after all that I've described about cockpit country, its importance in terms of climate resilience, its importance in terms of these climate resilient livelihoods, how is it that we could be in a position right now where there is a green light for mining in this area? You know, even in, in a situation where environmental experts, there's consensus that this is a place that should be protected because of its ecological and cultural importance. Well, the answer is quite simple from a human rights and legal perspective. This has been done by excluding vulnerable communities and experts from effective participation in the decision-making process. And this question of environmental democracy or lack thereof, I think is at the heart of climate crisis in the Caribbean. And just to give you an example, and I'm describing Jamaica, but this is repeated across the Caribbean. In this case, with respect to the green light for mining in the cockpit country area, the environmental impact assessment was prepared by consultants who are paid by the mining company and who are not required to meet any statutory criteria under Jamaican law. The consultants then embarked upon an environmental impact assessment process that is not governed by any binding regulations, but rather by outdated guidelines that fall short of international standards. The consultants co sub subsequently prepared an environmental impact assessment based on terms of reference that only cover limited environmental and socioeconomic issues. So the unsurprising result of this astonishing record of regulatory abdication is an environmental impact assessment that is biased and that fails to meet the limited environmental and socioeconomic issues that the company was expected to address. As I said, you know, this story of environmental devastation and exclusion is not idiosyncratic, nor is it aberrational. I mean, I've studied com communities and countries across the Caribbean where we see this story repeated, you know, from Haiti, where rural communities face threats from the emerging gold mining sector, but have been excluded from participation in decision making. It is repeated in countries like Guyana, where the environmental regulator has shown no willingness to regulate the oil and gas industry. In effect, communities across the Caribbean are left with no access to participation, no access to effective remedies to take action on climate change. So, I want to conclude with a perspective on a human rights agenda for combating the climate crisis, or rather, if we can switch it around, an agenda for promoting climate justice. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm a human rights lawyer, but I'll be the first to tell you that human rights bodies and the human rights system, including bodies such as the United Nations, have been complicit in sustaining the situation of exclusion and crisis. These bodies have intentionally focused on promoting political and civil rights while ignoring the economic, social, cultural and environmental rights that could help to create a more equitable international order. And importantly, they have marginalized the voices of racial, racialized communities who are most impacted by climate change. But even at the domestic level, um, I think Communities don't have access to take climate action against projects that would impact their environment and well being. Even the major climate cases in the Caribbean now, whether the case in Jamaica that's challenging mining in the cockpit country, or the climate case in Guyana that's challenging ex you know, the oil, oil and gas industry, you know, these cases, first of all, are usually framed in limited terms in that they either focus on the right to a healthy environment while kind of excluding the broader context of economic, social, and cultural rights. And then even if you look at the right to a healthy environment itself, that right is not protected consistently across the Caribbean. It's protected in Guyana in arguably limited, in a limited form, but this is not the case across most other Caribbean, Caribbean nations. And so, and the last point I'll make on that, these cases are not designed to challenge the underlying structures that fuel climate crisis. And so the question for lawyers and human rights lawyers is, how do we confront the complicities of you know, our field while simultaneously creating a, an agenda for transformation, an agenda not just for remedies in one particular case in one particular area, but an agenda for transformation 
towards a new social and international order that is more equitable and that can bring us to a future beyond climate crisis. So I'm gonna make a few observations and then I will, I will hand over to the, to the next panelist. So my first observation is that climate justice must mean transformative justice. It is about the creation of just economic and political systems that build pathways to a future beyond climate crisis, beyond extractivism, beyond racial capitalism. So for the human rights legal community, what we need is an agenda for a rights-based, earth-centered paradigm for post-colonial development. And when I say these things, I know it makes you know lawyers and maybe even people in the human rights field uncomfortable because we are not accustomed to dealing with issues of political economy. And I would say, in fact, we intentionally kind of like hesitate to confront those issues. As I said, by focusing on the civil and political rights, but not really talking about issues of redistribution or the economic, social and cultural rights that could really lead to economic transformation. Second, Human rights legal work on climate justice in the Caribbean must be centered around empowering historically marginalized communities to claim economic, social, and environmental rights. Rights to land, rights to water, food sovereignty, and cultural survival. These communities have the most innovative solutions to the climate crisis, and their imaginings could build pathways to a sustainable future. The human rights system has climate justice tools that we can use right now, including the ESCASO Regional Agreement for Latin America and the Caribbean. This agreement provides a framework for strengthening climate action through public participation in environmental decision making and access to information and knowledge. And, you know, just up to pause here, um, with this understanding of the importance of empowerment, um, last week while on mission to one of the communities affected by bauxite mining, my primary aim in that initial meeting was you know, informing communities about the human rights framework with the understanding that when communities are empowered to claim rights, they can take action in defense of their land and environment and take action against climate change. So the second, the third point is that um, human rights work should promote recognition of the human right to a healthy environment. This is astonishing, but this right is still not recognized in many Caribbean countries, as I said, and it is not even recognized in any treaty of global application. In fact, it was only in 2020 that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights recognized or affirmed the right to a healthy environment as being protected by the American Convention on Human Rights, which means that for the whole period before 2020, this right was not protected. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And of course, we can't talk about climate justice without securing nature's right to exist. In other words, it is time to shift from an anthropocentric human rights paradigm to a more holistic earth-centered paradigm. And on that point, you know, these, the development in terms of ecocide as a crime, you know, the crime of ecocide is one interesting development that could create some accountability in terms of companies and you know, investment projects that involve and are based on the complete devastation of the environment. Another point is that climate justice work should also involve promotion of respect for the rights of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant and rural communities. And so um, I see that I have, I think one minute left or we have to, to end now, okay. So uh, my last point is that climate justice must involve um, reparations and by reparations, I mean, you know, the, to the eradication of this current system of exploitation and transformation to a new just equitable social order. So with that, I will end here. <laughs> wow, Malene, I, I really, really did not want to interrupt you. It was almost for me a call to arms like a revolutionary movement, but part of the, the point of this is to sort of make it not something that is sounds so extreme, but something that actually, as you describe it, emanates from our experience and should be so natural and obvious to us in terms of the approach to uh, to recalibrating, redesigning the way international law responds to, as you describe it, an extension of uh, exploitative um, approaches to these islands and our people. And so this, this is it, the, the way you describe it. I feel like the regime I'm part of and trade and even investment are such blunt instruments compared uh, to the way you're describing a much more laser focused approach of the eco, eco sock and cultural rights. Um, and I wonder whether 
um, as we move on to more self-contained regimes like investment, trade, and the environment, climate change negotiations, whether there's not so much more to learn from your approach, which seems in a lot of ways more disparate, you know, whether it's health or whether it's human rights or these other regimes, but nonetheless evoke such a strong uh, reaction in terms of how we can more directly address some of the issues you raise. I really want us to get to your Q&A, the Q&A, but wonderful, wonderful um, remarks. Thank you so much for that perspective. We're going to move really swiftly over now to Ruana Haynes, who's going to uh, give us her perspectives, much more, I would say, from the trenches of uh, the UN Triple C negotiations, what's happening with the region, and its articulation of the SIDS concerns in the context of Glasgow uh, and, and Paris. So over to you, Ruana. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And, um... Just to say, I consider it a real privilege to be on the panel with all of you. I think the presentations that have been given so far, I mean, have really given me a lot of food for thought personally in terms of the work that I do within the UNFCCC and squarely hit the nail on the head in terms of articulating where we're at and what some of the major issues are in the Caribbean region uh, within CARICOM as it relates to this, this mega question of, of climate change and how we are dealing with the climate crisis. So just by way of adding a little context to my remarks, um, I work with um, an international non-governmental organization called Climate Analytics uh, that's originally headquartered in Berlin and we've just established an office in Trinidad Tobago, Climate Analytics Caribbean. And the focus of my work has really been on trying to ensure that the voices of small island developing states are heard and are adequately reflected in the context of the global discussion where we live that reality of marginalization, where we live that reality of being seen to be on the fringes of the global economic order, having very limited influence over discussions because of our limited economic um, limited economic power, either individually, either as a region, so the CARICOM region, or even more broadly internationally as small island developing states, which is the broad umbrella under which we negotiate. So in terms of understanding how we sort of leverage ideas around climate justice into this broader discussion, um, it's one that is, of course, very, very close to the hearts, I would say, of people, of even governments, representatives from small island development states, um, primarily because of our lived reality. Um, but I would also say that I agree fully with the analysis that was given by Malini on all of the different levels of complicity that still exist, uh, all of the continued um, post-colonial practices and mentalities, rules, laws, regulations, uh, policies that our own governments continue to promote, unfortunately. So in terms of my remarks, I would want to focus on, I think, two key areas that are closely, closely linked and interrelated with the presentations that we heard earlier from Akima and also from Malini. Um, and these two issues would be, in the first case, accountability, and in the second case, liability. And on this question of accountability, so within the uh, international climate change negotiation setting, there has been historically, since the beginning of uh, the regime in 1992, a lack of accountability in terms of the global process being unable to mobilize itself to hold countries seriously to account for their climate commitments. Um, we'll get back to the point as to whether or not countries are making sufficient climate commitments, but even in the case where they have made political commitments, holding them accountable has been very difficult. So we've had about 30 plus years of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in that time, we have primarily been in what is termed a regime building type of activity. So we have moved from 
the framework convention that set out very broadly key principles, uh, but very few actual commitments for states on the understanding that the follow-up agreement, which turned out to be the Kyoto Protocol, would be the primary place for those commitments to sit. And so at that time, the common understanding was that climate change is a problem for the global south, and I don't like that term, but it's convenient, that has primarily been caused by actions by the industrial revolution and industrialization and overconsumption in the global north. And so under the Kyoto Protocol, you had commitments being taken primarily by industrialized nations. We moved on from that to the Paris Agreement with a few stops along the way, but I don't have time for, to describe all of them. So we are now in a paradigm where hopefully we are putting the closing chapters onto this regime building. We've come to the point where we recognize um, we continue to recognize climate change as a common concern of humankind, but and where we call on governments to ensure that they respect, promote, and consider respective obligations on human rights and taking action to address climate change. We've come to the point where all states now are recognized as having obligations to act on climate change, to reduce their global emissions footprint, to make their own um, countries more resilient to the impacts of climate change. We are discussing now for the first time in an increasingly serious manner, the question around loss and damage and the irrevocable losses that have occurred over time as a result of climate impacts. And so we are at a more mature stage in the global discussion on this issue. And as a result, in the way we have developed international institutions to help with this issue of accountability. And yet it is still something that eludes us. So flashing forward now to the last COP we had in Glasgow, there were a number of claims that, and I, I heard it described in this way, that the cops are becoming increasingly colonized by private interests that are hell-bent on promoting greenwashing. And so this question of accountability occurs. All of these announcements that are being made, including by some of the worst offenders in the game, the Shells, the Exxons, those who have participated um, over time in the extractive uh, colonization of uh, small developing countries. Um, you have all of, these, all of these announcements that are being made, but who is actually tracking the impacts of them? Who is actually checking to see whether or not they deliver? And if these announcements, these initiatives are not delivered on, what are the remedies? Are there remedies in place? Is there an international forum? And I really enjoyed Akima's presentation in terms of pointing out some of the options that are available in terms of investment law. And I think I agree, I'm not certain that investment law and arbitration is really the place for some of this to be litigated, but also national courts and novel international fora. We have Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu um, organizing the, the Islands Commission and going to the uh, Commission on the Law of the Sea, the Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, in order to have some of these issues addressed. Um, as to whether or not any of these would be successful, that remains to be seen. But I think it is fair to say that the more we are able to advance the international process, especially as it relates to the institutions that are in place to address this question of accountability, the easier it will become for us to be able to use some of these institutions to also ensure that we can have accountability at the national level. So for example, under the Paris Agreement, countries have all agreed to an enhanced transparency framework where all countries have to present reports on a biennial basis to show how they are implementing their commitments. It is supposed to be a very transparent process. It is supposed to be a process that is also open to review. And so, but it is not yet in place globally. It comes into place in 2024. So what I'm leading to on this question of accountability is that we are not quite there yet. Some advancement has been made, 
the more advancement we make at the international level, the better it is at the national level, the easier it is at the national level for us to be able to respond as well. Um, one consequence of the enhanced transparency framework is that even at the regional level, there's no recognition that climate legislation, national climate legislation is actually needed. So as part of my work within the region, we are in the process of working with some pilot countries to try to develop model climate legislation for the region. And this has been done, this recognition has come about in response to the international process and all of the various elements of um, the international arrangements that have been put in place by the Paris Agreement and that we continue to negotiate. My second point that I want to raise is this question of liability and touching on essentially who pays, um, who is really responsible. I think from Malini's presentation, it is clear that everyone is actually responsible um, to some extent or the other. But when we look at climate change and the climate crisis from a scientific point of view, it is very clear that the weight of responsibility, at least for the level of warming we see today, we are now at 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The rate of warming that we're experiencing today that is causing loss and damage in real time, prim the primary responsibility lies with industrialized nations. And so this question of loss and damage, what it is, what does it include? Does it include economic losses only? Does it include non-economic losses? What about aspects of culture? What about countries that will actually lose land mass as a result of rising sea levels? Is one that is increasingly uh, important in the context of the global discussion in terms of lending it any notion of legitimacy. And it also has its role to play in the context of how we imagine climate justice. And in the way that Malini has explained in terms of it being also a racial justice issue, loss and damage occurs in that sense as well. And under the Paris Agreement, um, with the leadership of the United States and the complicity of the European Union and other industrialized nations, we have explicitly excluded liability from the international discussion. Um, we have explicitly excluded the possibility that the discussion on loss and damage that takes place under the Paris Agreement can contribute in any way to liability and compensation matters that may arise. Now that does not, that carve out does not apply more broadly to remedies under international law per se. But if you think about the fact that it has taken us almost 30 years to get to the point where we can actually substantially discuss all of the issues that arise when we speak to the question of loss and damage, you can see that it is a quite damaging thing that has been done to exclude that entire evidence base from matters that may come forward in the future. Now, this is still being litigated in the international discussion because whereas we have this exclusion in the context of the Paris Agreement, it does not apply under the parent agreement, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So actually to give you some insight into what is happening right now, uh, there is a push from the United States and others to have all of our discussions on loss and damage um, focused primarily in the context of the Paris Agreement and not under the UNFCCC where the carve-out does not apply. And this is something that has yet to be settled. Um, I sense that a reckoning is coming quite soon and we will see where it leads us. So just to sum up briefly in terms of what I think the way forward is and what are some of the solutions, I would say that what we actually need to be doing, thinking about these issues from a uniquely Caribbean perspective, is what we have been doing in a way, which is operating at all levels, every way. The solutions to these issues lie both within the climate process as the primary fora for setting the global agenda, for making the international arrangements, for setting up the governance systems that can then have a knock-on effect on what we do at the domestic levels, what we do at the regional levels. But it is a conversation that needs to take place inside 
as well as outside, because as we've heard, it goes to every single aspect of our economic development. So it must inform our bilateral investment treaties. It must inform our approaches to investment as nation states, as a region as well. And you know, it is not something that we can afford to continue to silo, which is what we have been doing to some degree. At this point, I think it is time for us to start to join the dots, even while we work on all levels everywhere, which uh, unfortunately seems to be our portion. But uh, from my assessment, this is, this is the way that we will need to go. So I think I'll stop there. Um, just at the 15 minute mark and I don't want to have Janiv uh, cutting me off unfortunately and I look forward to the Q&A uh, after this. Thank you. Oh wow, um, Ron, I would not cut you off um, uh, because just like all of my other uh, pre preceding speakers, you've been brilliant um, and so it's really hard to get 180 degree well 360 degree and each of our individual topics but ladies you've done such a wonderful job in bringing the core questions and honing in on them for the audience um i said that i so thank you for that there are some questions in the chat that i will um, ask you to just chew on whilst i do my presentation which i will um take the hit in a sense because i'm not going to be able to do it justice in the time we have left um, but I, I would ask um, for the audience to indulge me. Um, I've put in the chat um, a sort of a, a link to a more fulsome version of what I'm going to present, which is this interface between trade and climate change that is the product of um, quite some work between myself, Rowana, as well as Miss Casey Ellis Bourne. Um, that we, we published um, as part of an SRC policy, policy brief last year um, in the sort of interregnum between the UNFCCC negotiations, Glasgow, and what was supposed to be the WTO's ministerial conference in December, but we know that that has been uh, sort of delayed. And part of our work program in 2021 was to start bringing these two issues of climate change and trade together in a comprehensive brief that would begin or whet the appetite, especially of CARICOM policymakers in thinking more holistically and comprehensively about how to create a path for dealing with climate change, which is an existential trade related crisis within uh, the corners of trade negotiations and trade rules. So I'm going to truncate my presentation in the interest of some discussion, and I would invite you to look at the uh, almost 100 page brief we prepared in that context. What I want to really just focus in on um, for this presentation is really sort of start off with as much as I can present in terms of the trade profile of CARICOM countries, uh, thinking in terms of uh, what resonance a trade related agenda may have based on our current profile. And that is that most greenhouse gas emissions from CARICOM countries emanate from the combustion of fossil fuels and transport, power plants, refineries, industrial processes, and agriculture. That Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Suriname are countries with oil refineries, and they are also the top three manufacturers in the region. And that recent data suggests that CARICOM countries contribute on average between 0.00 and 0.05% of the world's annual CO2 emissions with Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname contributing the most, but all minuscule in, in comparison with developing and developed countries with bigger economies. Um, as I mentioned, the main source of our energy consumption is fossil fuels, and we have a large, that occupies a large percentage of our import bills, there have been moves to uh, transforming economies so that they use more renewable energy sources. And so there are targets by Barbados, Jamaica, for instance, to meet energy targets of 75, 20% renewable by 2030 or 2037. And this is eminently possible in light of the abundance of solar, wind, geothermal energy, and hydropower in the region, 
even though investment in these sectors is particularly low, which is part of our broader problem in the region of limited FDI in these sectors that are capable of making us more energy efficient. So that's kind of thinking in terms of uh, the climate crisis where trade um, sort of figures become relevant. So when we look formally at the rules of the WTO, uh, the experts will say that there's no real uh, specialized rules on climate change, although a lot of these concerns have now been foisted onto ongoing provisions uh, that were created and rules created when the WTO um, was created in 1995 or even before that in 1947. There are some uh, basic rules relating with that interface between trade and climate change. Uh, or trade and the environment, excuse me. And there are also pre-existing committees at the WTO that deal with things like trade and the environment. And more recently, we have um, the structured discussions on environmental sustainability, the informal dialogue on plastics and the ongoing negotiations on fossil fuels, where CARICOM's participation really is very, very low, except in the context of the plastics ongoing discussions. Uh, a greater presence of CARICOM member states is felt in discussions looking at the impact on natural disasters and trade, uh, where we have actually taken quite the lead in some of the discussions. But none of this has yet kind of translated into formal negotiating mandates or positions that would ultimately see uh, rights bases for some of these concerns. On the bilateral front, the region, again, has not, because it has had quite a, I would say, um, a minuscule or a minimal uh, bilateral trade agenda, um, especially since 2008, when the CARA Forum EPA was negotiated. We now have the UK CARA Forum, which is really just a rollover um, of obligations under that preceding 2008 EPA. And the provisions there, again, as compared with some of the more state-of-the-art provisions in recent FTAs, really just deal with very basic provisions that seek to um, replicate obligations under multilateral environment agreements, but don't really do much in terms of uh, bringing uh, accountability and greater sort of market access opportunities in environmental goods and services. Uh, that we would really see a benefit to the region. And here, I, I just want to say that there's a post Cotonou agreement that has been signed but not entered into force, um, at least not ratified formally um, for some countries um, that may form the basis of some um, headway in terms of more biting obligations um, and more um, climate change specific obligations for the region. But again, the financing instrument under that agreement uh, is still to be uh, sort of negotiated and, and, and finalized. So in terms of CARICOM's offensive interest in using trade negotiations as a way of advancing our concerns, um, that's still something that I think we need to think a little bit more about. Um, now, what we did at the SRC in our uh, policy brief was we tried that now to think about the trade obligations that CARICOM member states might be uh, interested in taking based on what is in the um, nationally determined contributions that they made in the context of Glasgow, some of them, but some of them did not update their NDCs. Um, in, in, most of them did, but some of them did not. And we created on our website a database of uh, the broad NDCs, but also those that have more of a trade component. And what we found is that CARICOM countries have made certain commitments that are trade related, including reducing um, tariffs for the importation of renewable energy equipment um, in order to meet their GHG emission targets, establishing building and energy efficiency technical standards, uh, environmental labeling requirements, providing tax incentives for renewable energy um, programs, pursuing green procurement programs, um, and ultimately also imposing, many countries have imposed these import bans on single-use plastics. And some have even come forward with ideas uh, for market-based carbon pricing and taxation schemes. Now, in this connection, I want to just uh, pay tribute to something coming out of the University of Guyana, uh, 
Guyana is an interesting test case of how the Caribbean, because of the recent discovery of oil, is really going to promote that and all of the downstream positive that import revenue can generate against climate change and how a government um, with these great resources is going to reconcile that against its international uh, climate change obligations. And I think that's, that's going to be an interesting space to watch. Uh, but the University of Guyana came up with the idea for an upstream carbon tax um, to kind of tax um, uh, carbon and, and fossil fuel extraction at the closer to the source for all of the reasons that are, are articulated in, in the policy brief we created. And on the issue also just of carbon pricing and where the Caribbean sits on this debate, we know that the European Union's uh, CBAM um, so it's, it's carbon um, border adjustment mechanism potentially negatively impacts the Trinidad and Tobago fertilizer industry, which because Trinidad and Tobago is actually the fourth largest exporter of fertilizer to the EU, which is one of the sectors that is going to be targeted by that EU CBAM. It's not something that has generated much discussion or technical work in the region. So these are interesting times. I think the paper or the policy brief sets all of these issues um, out quite um, elaboratively, er elaboratively, but what I want to hone in on for the next one minute really is uh, the kind of the recommendations coming out from that very uh, initial work that we tried to do, which is more expository than actually coming up with the technical solutions. And these are this. A CARICOM actually has a lot of institutions at the regional level that each in their own siloed ways are proposing ways of dealing with climate change. However, the intersection between these efforts, renewable energy, climate change, and trade um, is kind of is, is kind of uh, demonstrated by the discussion we're having here, a lack of intersection of all these different obligations and all of these different approaches um, by the region. And I think this is an opportunity for perhaps trade, because it's quite a well-developed regime, to force the conversation to be had at the regional level, streamline some of the initiatives on climate change, renewable energy, trade, and I dare say human rights investment as well with our sustainable development goals being led by uh, the intergovernmental organ of CARICOM called COTED, as well as in my view, the funding uh, agency of the Caribbean Development Bank that can begin coordinating these positions. The technical work has to be done in research in key areas that will improve the ability of CARICOM negotiators to make the substantive contributions on ongoing climate change negotiations. And we at the SRC see our role as being very integral to giving the technical uh, basis for some of these offensive and defensive interests um, that we can articulate. At the domestic level, there must be better coordination across ministries with responsibility, not just for climate change, finance, renewable energy, trade, um, but also education and health, all of these things are not, these conversations are not happening in a cross-disciplinary way. And finally, I think well, my penultimate point is really using key positioning that we have in international fora, like Barbados's Prime Minister Motley's presidency of UNCTAD, positions in the WTO secretariat and committees that our CARICOM nationals hold in EOSIS as well, to promote our interests will really be advocacy tool that will be combined with the technical work. And without being self-promotional here with my ladies on this panel, establishing what I call a battalion of CARICOM litigators with experience in high level litigation before international and domestic tribunals. So really uh, mining into these resources we have in the region uh, to articulate, to begin thinking about these in a cross-disciplinary way so that we can articulate a position in a holistic way to the benefit of uh, CARICOM and its member states. So I'm going to stop here. I think we, we have zero minutes left. Um, I wonder if my two remaining panelists have any closing remarks. Um, if you could look at the Q&A section, the windows um, in, in your one-minute summation, and then we will really have to go. So I'm going to start with Malini. Your one minute starts now, and then Rowena, you take it up, and then I'll bring everything to a close. Well, thanks so much. Um, I think I said a mouthful in my initial presentation, so I will just conclude by um, saying that 
you know, what we need from all fields, whether it's law or even within the legal profession, people focusing on trade or human rights or the environment um, is a commitment to certain fundamental principles and ideas about how we ought to exist in the world and what progress should look like, and then work together, you know, dedicating our expertise towards that future. Um, and so I will leave it there with that very vague and, and brief statement just to promote more innovative and radical thinking about how we can move to a transformative future. Um, yeah, so I'll just pick up quickly after Melania. I had a bit of a scan of the, the discussions and the, the questions in the in the chat. Um, and there was one about whether I think the Caribbean can really change by 2030 based on Paris Agreement commitments. And my answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, the changes have already begun. Uh, I think there is a, a question as to uh, how far we will get. <laughs> on that journey, but certainly certainly we are on the road. We are on the road and there is a lot that is going to be happening very quickly. Uh, I guess the only issue that remains to be resolved is the one put squarely forward to us by Malini as to the extent to which this is going to truly be transformational, which is something that we have to grapple with. Thank you. Ladies, let me bring this to a close and say that I was with Akima um, going on Malina, I. I saw you all in your individual spaces and I thought we have the beginning of a revolution here. And as I said, I don't want to cast it as a revolution because all we would be doing is using the tools of international law available to us in our disciplines to combine our powers and really think about the good of the nation, not wait for governments to do it, but in the spaces in which we operate to begin ventilating, advocating for change in a way that will conduce to our uh, development of, the, of our region. So on my behalf, on behalf also of um, you ladies on the panel, let me thank first of all um, the U.S. Embassy that has uh, worked with uh, the SRC to put forward these awareness raising types of activities under the MOU that we signed, as well as the ACIL International Economic Interest Group for giving us this platform to have this conversation and really bring up these issues uh, at the international level so that we can continue a conversation that we have started among ourselves. And I see a question in the audience about whether we're going to continue the interaction on this. Absolutely. My plan is that we will do this again. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We're four minutes over our allotted time. Thank you all. Um, panel addresses of the panel, um, email addresses of the panel. Again, you look look at the SRC website and our social media platforms. I will invite the ladies to share their panel, um, their email information, as well as look for the recording of this on our website. We will make it available for all to, to be, behold what I thought was a wonderful start to this conversation. Thank you all. Have a wonderful end of week and see you soon.